In just a few hours, Maryland men's basketball will square off in the NCAA tournament. We'll break down the Terps' path to a potential national championship and see how other Big Ten teams will fare against the field. All that and more coming up on this edition of the Left Bench in Focus. It's like a dream, dream come true, so. Yeah, again, I, I was trying to get out of there, man. Like, you know, everyone was trying to rub my head. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Left Bench in Focus, presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Ricky Podgorski, joined by Alex Ruin and Alexa. Some people call the holiday season the most wonderful time of year, but for me, March is the best time of year because the madness is just about to unfold. That's right, Ricky. The NCAA tournament is set to kick off shortly, but before the games get started and our brackets get busted, let's waste no time and take a look at how Maryland celebrated its birth in the big dance. Maryland is heading into March Madness with a record of 21 wins and 12 losses. The Terps were dubbed an 8 seed in the South region of this year's bracket. After a loss in the Big Ten tournament against Indiana, it was a quick turnaround to celebration. Maryland celebrated its birth in the NCAA tournament this past Selection Sunday. The now 8 seeded Terps will take on the 9 seeded West Virginia in the first game scheduled of the tournament. Um, again, I, I look at this much more as, you know, for the guys that haven't experienced the NCAA tournament, and really for this team. I mean, they these kids bought into our culture. They bought into our style. Um, they came in. They've, I've said it all along. They have, they've been one of the best teams to coach because they have a great attitude and they work hard. So. Yeah, definitely. Just um, a lot of emotions. Um, just working for this for four years. I'm a senior now, and just being able to get here, uh, it's like a dream, dream come true. So I'm just excited to be able to play uh, with these guys. Everybody was playing well. Great coach and all that. We had great defense. So ever since the first game, I believe we can make the tournament. A whole new coaching staff, four transfers, and the stage set for Kevin Willard's first season. And what an exciting one it was. The Terps came out strong, winning their first nine games, including claiming the 2022 Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off championship over Miami and an electric gold rush, gold rush win over number 16 Illinois. But a Big Ten game on the road ended Maryland's undefeated run and led to an uneasy point in its season. With losses to Wisconsin, Tennessee, UCLA, Michigan, and Rutgers, many fans feared the beginning of the season was too good to be true. But Willard and his team weren't finished yet. A huge win over number 24 Ohio State, where senior Jameer Young dropped 30 points and snacked 11 rebounds, would be just one of the 10 Big Ten games Maryland won at home, making them undefeated in conference play at Xfinity Center. Maryland continued to struggle on the road, going 2-9 for road games, but it always came back home to give the fans a treat, including a top-10 upset court storming over number 3 Purdue. The Terps entered the Big Ten tournament as the fifth seed and blew out Minnesota in the first round, but hopes of a Big Ten championship were squashed quickly by number 19 Indiana in the second round. However, like Ricky mentioned, it was a quick turnaround celebration. Maryland was named an eighth seed in the NCAA tournament and will face off against West Virginia later today. In his first year at Maryland, Jameer Young was selected to second team All Big Ten, and he's only adding to his accolades. Young has been selected to the U.S. Basketball Writers Association All District Third Team and the National Association of Basketball Coaches All District Second Team. Young averaged 16.1 points this year and has had a strong leadership role all season long. And although Young has made his impact felt in just one year with the program, Dante Scott and Hakeem Hart have been doing it for four, and they've been side by side for much longer than that. TSC's Kevin McNulty reports. Brotherhood. It's my brother. It's a word thrown around by teammates all the time. That's my brother, and that's, that's all I think about every time. But sometimes they actually mean it. We've been playing since we were little, you know, going to the same house, uh, hooping in the same backyard, you know, eating the same pizza all the time. Dante Scott and Akeem Hart, the only members of Maryland's roster that hung a banner in 2020. Now, they're just one day away from playing in their third NCAA tournament game together. For them, it just means more. Just growing up, seeing each other grow, stuff like that has been a journey. So this was this was about this was Maryland's about, uh, you know, family. Uh, we got each other back, and we just uh, you know gonna support each other. A new coach meant new faces this season, but for two guys that first teamed up when they were just 10 years old, their consistency has translated to wins in their senior season. They've brought it for four years, and they've brought it at a very high level. 
I just think it, it, it just shows you the, the level of character they are as, as people. Scott started 21 games for the Terps as a freshman. Since then, he started all but five games under three different head coaches, averaging double figures in each of the last three years. He's a pretty good guy to have in the locker room, too. He's probably one of the funniest guys I know to this day, so he's my guy. Hart has been a mainstay in the Terps lineup over the past two seasons as well. Logging more than 1,000 minutes for the first time this year. For these two Philadelphia natives, they value the fact that they've done it together. What is that relationship like? What does it mean to have a brother on your team that's playing 35 minutes a night with you? Um, it means a lot. Yeah, it means a lot. Um, it's just somebody that you could rely on. You know, sometimes you know it could get hard in this college basketball. So it's just somebody to, to be on your right side to, to help you push through the things. So. And in March, when nothing is guaranteed, it's about cementing their legacy in College Park. I think they've been, been very consistent since they've been here. Um, they've been they've been guys that this this program could depend on. You know, we are here because of Hakeem and Dante. I mean, Ricky, four years playing together, what better way to end it than going dancing? And if the Big Ten tournament was the sign for how Hakeem and Dante are going to perform in the Big Dance, it should be a decent run for the Terps. And before we look at Maryland's potential path through the South region, we're going to break down the first round matchups for a few of the other Big Ten teams in the dance. Sam, Jane, and Michael Howes are here to take us around the Big Ten. Guys? Thanks, guys. We'll start with Iowa, who had an early exit in this year's Big Ten tournament. The Hawkeyes are led by a familiar face with a different name for Big Ten fans, Chris Murray, who's Keegan Murray's twin brother. Murray averaged 20.4 points per game for Iowa this season, helping Iowa post a third adjusted offense in the nation, according to Ken Palm. The Hawkeyes also boast a Big Ten sixth man of the year and forward Peyton Sanford. The sophomore is a marksman from deep, shooting five threes a game for a 34.6% three-point percentage. In the past, Sam, Iowa has failed to consistently produce in the Big Ten tournament, falling in the first weekend in back-to-back -back years. They'll hope to fix that trend this year against the Auburn Tigers. The Tigers are another elite offensive squad, but they have struggled to shoot it lately, shooting only 31% from three on the year. Sam, this is a similar style of matchup for the, for the Penn State-Texas A&M game. Big Ten, SEC, threes galore, and potentially a down-to-the-wire finish. Yeah, no kidding, Mike. Whenever the SEC and Big Ten meet up, you know it's going to be a battle, and I don't think it's going to be any different with this SEC-Big Ten matchup and the Nittany Lions and Aggies when they play on Friday. As we know, elite guards win in March, and boy, does Penn State have that. You can see on your graphic, number 22, Jalen Pickett. That man is a bucket. He tore up the Terps in Happy Valley, and he continued to do so in the Big Ten tournament. Pickett is prone to post teams up, getting to a spot on both elbows and finding shooters on the wings. And when you're facing the Nittany Lions, the no-help defensive principles are in full effect. Seth Lundy, Andrew Funk, it seems as if Penn State just has a boatload of shooters on the roster. Lundy was particularly great in the Big Ten tournament, but has been streaky all year. Texas A&M was considered underseeded and will counter with size and athleticism, looking to beat Penn State up on the glass. But the Nittany Lions are going to try and silence the doubters getting their first Big Ten win, or NCAA tournament win, in over five years. So, we go from a team that's never done anything in March, it seems, to a coach whose fan base has coined a month after him. That's right, it's Mizzo season for Sparty. Tom Mizzo and Michigan State earned a seven seed in the NCAA tournament, and they're yet again looking to make another run in March. Sparty is another team with solid guards, as Tyson Walker's been balling out in his crescendo season. I mean, hitting ridiculous step-back threes all over the place. Tell me we haven't seen those type of shots before from small guards in March, huh, Mike? On the other side, Michigan State is going against a team with another good backcourt. That's going to be the USC Trojans. Boogie Ellis and Drew Peterson were both first-team All-Pac-12 selections and are looking to do serious damage in the dance, especially Boogie. It's a bad pun, I know. But neither team has an elite big man, so it'll be a guard show in Ohio, Mike which is a little surprising for a Big Ten team that's league is filled with elite bigs. Well, that trend ends here because Indiana is a big man show led by Trace Jackson Davis. As many Big, big Ten fans and Terp fans know, TJD is one of the premier stars in the Big Ten, averaging 20.8 points per game and adding 10.9 boards. 
The Hoosiers are set to face the 12 seeded Kent State Golden Flashes. Kent State will look to expose the defensive weaknesses of Indiana Sam. According to Kent Palm, the Hoosiers have the 43rd adjusted defensive efficiency ranking. Kent State is led by senior guard Sincere Carey. Elite guards win in March, as you said, and Carey is old and elite. The senior averages 17.6 points a game, earning the MAC Tournament MVP. Tune into this game because you might see a couple slamajamas from the Kent State side. Forward Chris Payton has found himself on the highlight reel multiple times this season with his high flying dunks. It's too bad Dickie V isn't calling this game, Sam, because we would be getting some great calls from him. Yeah, we all miss Dickie V, and he's got to get on an NCAA tournament game soon. I mean, think about it. You got the diaper dandy, the PTP. Oh, it's a big time shot. Those are all legendary calls, and Dickie V is such a you know goat in the industry. But again, he won't be calling any of these games, but Ricky and Alexa, it's going to be super interesting to see how all these games play out with all these mid-seeded Big Ten teams that, you know, aren't necessarily high up there, but have interesting matchups. Now, with any of the Big Ten teams, I personally think Purdue has the best chance of going far this tournament. Like the fellas said over there, I think Penn State might make a good run, but Kent State looks really dangerous over Indiana. I mean, the Big Ten has so many flaws, but also so many strengths. I think it's a toss-up between any team, but we will see. Now stay right here because when we come back, Alexa and I will break down the south region of this year's bracket and see Maryland's potential path to cutting down the nets. We'll also reveal our Turp of the Year Pro Turp and top five plays of the season. Don't go anywhere. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. There's so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years and I got my third child who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you. Welcome back to Left Bench in Focus, and it's time for some Bracketology. That's right, Ricky. We've talked about it all show. March Madness is upon us, and that means everyone is making their brackets. So why don't we give some insight into what we see the South Bracket looking like this tournament? All right, Alexa, let's start off with the round of 64. What do you see from the field, and what kind of games do you think we're going to get out of these first few matchups? So I'm going to start off with the Maryland-West Virginia game. I know a lot of people do have West Virginia coming out on top over Maryland, but I'm going to hold out for the Terps and have Maryland moving on to face Alabama in the round of 32. Now moving on to the Alabama-Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi game. I think Alabama is going to have an easy win over Corpus Christi. I mean, basically a home game in Birmingham. And on a talent on this team, I don't really see Alabama having any trouble. And Bama is just so prone to winning this year. They're just fantastic. Uh, now back to the bracket. This South region screams upsets to me. You got a 5-12 here between College of Charleston and San Diego State. College of Charleston is 31-3 on the year. They're a crazy good defensive team, an awesome offensive team. They take care of the ball on both sides of the floor. SDSU, though, 6-14 all-time in NCAA tournaments, and they've lost three straight, all of them first-round exits. Give me the Cougars moving on to the second round in your classic 5-12 upset. Now, on the bracket, a lot of buzz is around this Furman team right here. Virginia, the four seed, Furman, the 13. I think Virginia will get the job done. They're very experienced. Furman is an older team, but still Virginia has the head coach. And Tony Bennett is a fantastic coach. I think Virginia will move on. They're battle-tested. Five quad one wins this year. 
I think they'll get the job done. And the last game on my upset watch in the South region is this Baylor-UCSB game. The Guachos are legit. They lost by tw uh, one point in their 2021 appearance in the NCAA tournament. I just think, just like Virginia, Baylor is battle-tested. They are a veteran-like team. I think they move on. A whole lot of good games on this slate. Creighton NC State is going to be a fantastic one. But watch out for the Cougars at College of Charleston. All right, round of 32. Most likely the Crimson Tide will move on to this round and could potentially see Maryland. What do we think about that matchup? I mean, I think this is where the road will end for Maryland. If they get past Bob Huggins in West Virginia, they'd have to face the number one overall seed in this tournament. Alabama is legit. Brandon Miller is too good. Javon Quinterly is emerging in a brand new role for this team. I think we'll see more of the same from 2019 when Alabama thwomped Maryland. Uh, I got Alabama moving on, unfortunately taking down the Terps, even though this would be a great year for Kevin Willard if he were to move on. Uh, now, if the seeds hold in the bracket, we could see a six-seed Creighton take on three-seed Baylor. I like Creighton in this one. Uh, Big East is very competitive. Creighton kept it close this year against Arizona and Texas, who are both two-seeds in this tournament. Um, Creighton didn't get the job done in the Big East tournament, but I think they could upset Baylor and move on later on in the tournament. So now for um, me, I have Utah State upsetting Missouri in the first round and then scoring off against Arizona in the round of 32. And I don't think they're s stopping there. I mean, don't get me wrong with the Ari how Arizona is playing. When they're playing good, they're honestly great. However, I don't know what team we're going to see in the big dance this year. Along with that, Utah, Utah State just being older and more experienced, I could see an upset brewing. Um, I now also see a second upset, actually. And I know that's a bold statement to make. I know you had College of Charleston beating Stan San Diego State. I actually had San Diego State holding strong. And I'll have them face off against Virginia. Um, with that, I think that they have just not lost a game since December. They have only lost three games since December. And I think they're going to carry that momentum with them over into the next round. All right, well, let's look at the bracket again and see the top half for the Sweet 16 in the South region. Who do you think moves on to the Sweet 16 and then into the Elite Eight in the top half? So I have Alabama facing off against San Diego State. I think the Crimson Tide will have no problems defeating the Aztecs and will ease their way right into the Elite Eight. For me, on the bottom half of the bracket, I agree with Alabama. In the bottom half of the bracket, I have Arizona cruising all the way, basically, to the Elite Eight. This team is legit. Azulis Tubulas is an All-American. He can carry his team offensively and defensively. They're just so well-rounded. They're a big team. I think Arizona will represent the Pac-12 in the Elite Eight and face off against Bama. All right, Ricky, who wins in the Elite Eight and heads to the Final Four from the South? You know... I think Alabama will move on. I think Alabama has the easiest slate of any one seed in the entire tournament. They're the number one overall seed for a reason. Again, like I said, they're battle-tested in a very deep SEC conference. Give me the Crimson Tide going on to the Final Four, representing the South region. Now, what do you think, Alexa? I mean, I couldn't agree more. I have Alabama defeating San Diego State in the Sweet 16 and facing off against Creighton in the Elite Eight. I think the Crimson Tide are just all around a really well-put-together team. I mean, you have Brandon Miller leading the offense, great defensive game, and Charles Bediaco and Noah Clowney there to grab the boards. I don't think Creighton will be able to stop the Tide. The only reason I could see them facing some issues would be foul trouble or turnovers, but I think Alabama will roll past Creighton to the Final Four with little trouble. All right, we agree with Alabama. Big picture here. Who's cutting down the nets in Houston this year? I have Houston winning it all at um, all it all in their home city. Houston has been one of the best teams this season offensively and defensively, and I think they will have Marcus Sasser back and ready to go. I think the final two will be Alabama and Houston, and I think if Houston can get through Birmingham and through the Midwest, then they will shut Alabama down and get to cut the net at home. I have Houston. If Marcus Sasser can play, that will be a big factor if Houston can make it far. But like we said, I think Alabama moves on to the final four, and I think they will take on Duke in my final four bracket. Duke's a five seed, but they'd have to go through Oral Roberts, potentially Purdue. Um, on the other side of my bracket, I have Texas taking on UConn. Um, and in my championship matchup, I have Alabama versus UConn. Give me the con winning this year's NCAA tournament. I know I'm from Connecticut. I'm not biased. UConn is just a, such a well-rounded roster. They have a sniper, a fantastic scorer in Jordan Hawkins, a great set of big men, Adama Sonogo, All-American honorable mention, Don McClingan, a 7'2 freshman from Connecticut. You don't find that in many teams. Also, they got Andre Jackson, great rebounder, great defender. I like UConn. I think they'll be kicking on all cylinders. They got a tough matchup, though, against Iona in Albany. Rick Pitino, Danny Hurley, that's going to be just an electric atmosphere. I wish I could be there. But I like UConn winning it all. If they can beat Kansas later on, if the seed's hole, 
I don't see them losing to anybody in this year's March Madness. So give me UConn winning it all against Alabama. Well, it should be an interesting tournament, and I can't wait for it to get started. I'm you get in the chills thinking about it. <laughs> so we know we're nearing the end of the show, and we had some awesome plays from this season, but we also had some awesome sounds. Take a look. You can go refocus. Maybe you should. I, I, I saw people falling, so I just try to get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, again, I, I was trying to get out of there, man. Like, you know, everyone was trying to rub my head, and um, I was just trying to get back to the locker room, to be honest with you. I can handle the pressure. Um, I want them to enjoy this moment. We have four or five guys that are never going to play college basketball again. I want them to be able to sit back and, and realize this is a lot of fun this time of year. So this is what you work for. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna skip that one. They needed to, to relax, and so I told them a joke. To be honest, I just told them if someone would make a shot, I'd make the bald guy real happy, and that kind of made everybody laugh. I mean, Ricky, clearly Maryland is just fascinated with Kevin Willard's bald head. <laughs> and Kevin Willard does not like the words refocusing, redirecting, or regrouping. So many awesome moments from this year's season. No, definitely. Now I think it's time we name our Terp of the Year, and how could we give it to anyone else but him? Our Terp of the Year is the hometown hero himself, Jameer Young. Young has been the leader of the Terps all year long, from that game-clinching three against Illinois during the Gold Rush game in December, to leading his team to victory over number three Purdue in February. The senior averaged a team best 16.1 points per game and notched a season high 30 points and 11 rebounds against number 24 Ohio State. The first Maryland guard since Vasquez to score 30 points and grab 10 plus rebounds in a game. Not to mention he had eight 20 point games this season and led the team in steals with 42. Young was recently named all big 10 second team and to the USBWA and NABC all district teams. Congratulations to Jameer on an outstanding season and being named our Terp of the Year. And for our Pro Terp of the Year, it goes to none other than Mr. Red Velvet himself, who has been scorching hot in the league this year. After being traded from the Hawks to the Sacramento Kings, Kevin Herter has done nothing but ball out. Herter is averaging 15.2 points per game on almost 50% shooting from the field. Herter just dropped 28 points the other night against the Bucks and is one of the most important players on a team that currently sits at second in a loaded Western Conference. Congrats to Kevin Herter on being crowned our Pro Terp. All right, Ricky, let's roll right into our top five plays of the year. Get us going. Let's start off with Jameer Young, who elevates for the slam against Wisconsin. Young just, his head is basically at the rim of this play right there. What a dunk from Jameer. A million backdoor cut, Young splits the trap with a bounce pass, a 1-2 slam. Let's watch that one more time as a million throws it down on Trace Jackson Davis. Next up is a steal from Akeem Hart, a dish to Young and a lob to Ian Martinez. Akeem Hart is hyped up on that one. Ian Martinez was dunking all over Penn State on that day. We've already seen it, but it's too good to leave out. 16 seconds to go and Young pulls up deep and bang, an eruption through Xfinity. A game clenching three from the senior and probably the moment every Maryland fan knew the name, Jameer Young. And for our number one play, it's not from the players, it's from the fans. After beating Purdue, the Maryland crazy stormed the court and absolutely tore up College Park. Absolutely electric scene, beating Purdue. What a sight from the Maryland fans. And that's all for this edition of the Left Bench in Focus. We won't be here next week because it's our spring break. So we'll see you on the 27th, and Alex Gary and Alana Munich will be anchoring. And make sure you're keeping up with all of Terrapin Sports coverage on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and online at terrapinsportscentral.com. We'll see you next time.